Hi, welcome back to our class. Today, we are going to open a new chapter that is on matter and its properties. I presume that all of you knows how to define what is matter and also the three states of matter. So, we will just forgo the definition and the states of matter. In this chapter, we will be discussing about the classification of matter and its properties. If we're going to make a diagram on the classification of matter, we have matter is classified into pure substance and a mixture. Let's focus our discussion first on the pure substance. A pure substance is a kind of matter where its composition is the same all throughout the system. What do we mean by that? Suppose if you have a handful of table salt and you are going to get a sample at some parts of that handful of table salt, then get a sample at the middle part and on the other part. All these samples will have the same composition. It's only NaCl. Now, the pure substance is of two groups. We have the element and the compounds. An element is composed of only one kind of atom. And it is represented by symbols. Now, how are these symbols being taken? The symbols are taken from the first letter of the name of the element. For example, carbon, it has a symbol of C. Oxygen, it has a symbol of O. Hydrogen, it has a symbol of H. Nitrogen, it has a symbol of N. There are also symbols which are taken from the first letter and the second letter of the name of the element. For example, calcium. So the symbol is CA. Bromine. So the symbol is BR. Helium. The symbol is HE. Neon, the symbol is NE. And there are also those symbols which are taken from the first and the third letters of the name of the element. For example, chlorine, the symbol is CL. Chromium, the symbol is CR. And there are also those symbols which are taken from the Latin names of the element. For example, the gold is AU because the Latin name is Aurum. Iron, the symbol is FE because the Latin name is Ferrum. Lead, the symbol is PB because the Latin name is Plumbum. Mercury, the symbol is HG because it's taken from the Latin name Hydrogerum. Now, this element is of three groups. We have the metallic element, the metalloids, and the non-metallic elements. The metallic elements possess the following characteristics. Number one, they are lustrous. What do we mean by lustrous? That means it glitters or it shines brightly. Another is malleable. When we say malleable, it means it can be hammered into a different shape. Another is ductile. Now, by ductility, it means 
that the metal can be stretched into fine wires. For example, you have the guitar string, you have the electrical wirings. So these are some examples of the metallic property, which is ductile. The fourth is a good conductor of heat and electricity. What do you think is that metal considered as the best conductor of electricity? It is silver. For the metalloids group, this possess the characteristic in between the metals and the nonmetals. They may be lustrous, but not as much as that of the metallic elements. And these metalloids are considered to be semiconductors. Good examples of the metalloids are the germanium, the silicon. And for the non-metallic elements, these are characterized to be dull in color. Just look at carbon and sulfur. Likewise, phosphorus. They don't glitter. They're not lustrous. Another is they are brittle. What do we mean by brittle? That means it can easily be crushed. And they are good insulators because non-metallic elements do not conduct heat and electricity. Let's go to the other kind of pure substance, that is the compound. The compound is a pure substance that is composed of two or more kinds of atoms. And they are chemically combined in constant and definite proportion. Meaning that you cannot change the component of the compound. For example, if you have water, the component of water is two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Thus the formula is H2O. And the compounds are represented by chemical formulas. There are two kinds of compounds. We have the ionic compound and the covalent compounds. For the ionic compounds, these are compounds in which they are formed when an electron from one atom transfers to another atom or electrons from one atom transfer to the other atom. For example, in the case of sodium chloride, sodium has 11 electrons and of these 11 electrons, there is one electron in the outermost energy level. And this electron is the valence electron, which is responsible for a chemical reaction. While chlorine has 17 electrons, and if you're going to make a diagram of chlorine, there are seven electrons in the outermost energy level. So these seven electrons in the outermost energy level are called the valence electrons. And so they are the electrons responsible for a chemical reaction. A while ago I said that Ionic compounds are formed when one or more electrons from one atom will transfer to the other atom. In this case, going back to the sodium atom, since there is only one electron in the outermost energy level, this one electron will transfer to the atom chlorine. So, they will be bonded ionically. Most of the metallic compounds are ionically bonded. Sodium chloride is an example of a metallic compound. Another kind of compound is the
covalent compound. In the covalent compound, this is formed when electron or electrons share in order to form the compound. So what does this mean? Two or more atoms will be sharing their electrons in the outermost energy level to form the compound. For example, in the formation of water, there is one atom of oxygen and there are two atoms of hydrogen. In this case, since there are eight electrons of oxygen in which two of these electrons occupy the first energy level and the six will occupy the second energy level. These six electrons are considered as the valence electrons. Now, if you get the electronic configuration of oxygen, notice that of those six electrons in the outermost energy level, there are two electrons which are unpaired. Now, with these unpaired electrons of the oxygen, we'll be sharing with the electrons of the hydrogen atoms. Since there are two unpaired electrons, so it requires two hydrogen atoms to share their electrons with the oxygen. So, the chemical formula of water is H2O because there are two atoms of hydrogen and only one atom of oxygen. Another is the hydrochloric acid or the HCl. In the hydrochloric acid, there are seven electrons in the outermost energy level of chlorine, while hydrogen has only one electron. Now, this one electron of the hydrogen will share with one of the electrons of the chlorine in the outermost energy level in order to form the hydrochloric acid. Now, most of the non-metallic compounds are covalently bonded. More of the nomenclature of these compounds will be learned in the next chapter. So we'll just proceed with the other group of matter. On the other side of the classification of matter, we have the mixture. Mixture is defined as a kind of matter where it is composed of two or more substances in variable proportion, meaning that their composition can be varied. Now, there are two kinds of mixture. We have the homogeneous mixture and the heterogeneous mixture. A homogeneous mixture is that kind of mixture where it only exhibits one phase and you cannot distinguish anymore where are the other components. A good example for this is a solution. By the way, a solution is a homogeneous mixture composed of a solvent and the solute. Usually, in a solution, the solute is in lesser amount than the solvent. Now, there are also kinds of solution. We have a solid solution, we have a liquid solution, and a gaseous solution. When we talk of a solid solution, a good example for this is the metallic alloy. And there are many metallic alloys. One would be the bronze. The bronze is a solid solution composed of copper and tin. Another is the brass. The brass is composed of the copper and zinc. Another is the steel. The steel is composed of the iron and carbon. Another kind of solution is the liquid solution, 
which is the most common form of solutions. Now, the liquid solution is a solution wherein its final phase is, of course, a liquid. Good examples for this are the sodium chloride dissolved in water. So if you're going to dissolve the sodium chloride as the solute in the solvent water, there is only one phase that you can see. You have there only a transparent or a colorless mixture. Another example is the salicylic acid dissolved in the alcohol. The good solvent for salicylic acid, by the way, is the alcohol. It's not water. It cannot be dissolved in water. It can only be dissolved in the alcohol. Now, if you're going to look at the salicylic acid solution, it's also colorless. And another example is the sugar dissolved in the water. Take note that when the sugar is dissolved in water, this will give us a transparent solution. You can no longer distinguish where is the solute sugar in that solution. Another is the gaseous solution. A good example for this is the mixture of gases in the atmosphere. Let's go to the other kind of mixture, the heterogeneous mixture. When we say a heterogeneous mixture, this is a kind of mixture wherein it presents to us two or more phases and the components of the mixture can be distinguished. Examples of a heterogeneous mixture are the oil when mixed with water, the table salt when added with the oil, the antimony when dissolved in carbon disulfide, or the sand added with water. So these are good examples of heterogeneous mixture. A suspension is another good example of a heterogeneous mixture. Now, lies between the homogeneous mixture and the heterogeneous mixture is the colloid. A colloid is an intermediate state between a homogeneous and the heterogeneous mixture. Now, if in the solution, the components are the solute and the solvent, in the colloid, the components are the dispersed phase and the dispersing medium. So if you're going to make a comparison between the solution and the colloid, the solute in the solution is equivalent to the dispersed phase in the colloid, and the solvent in the solution is equivalent to the dispersing medium in the colloid. Colloids contains colloidal particles wherein these colloidal particles are so small that they have no tendency to settle down. They remain to be suspended within the dispersing medium. That's why the homogenized milk is considered a colloid. It's not a homogeneous mixture. If you're going to compare the colloid with that of a solution, I said a while ago that a solution is transparent, meaning you can see through. But a colloid, which looks like homogeneously mixed, but you cannot see through. Look at the milk as compared to a solution of the sodium chloride. Isn't it? You can see through the sodium chloride solution, but you cannot see through the milk. There are properties possessed by the colloid. The first property is the Brownian movement. This Brownian movement is otherwise known as the motion effect, 
meaning that the tiny particles in a colloidal system have no tendency to settle down. They keep on moving in a zigzag random motion. So this motion effect stabilizes a substance or a mixture called a colloid. Another property possessed by a colloid is the Tendal effect, or this is otherwise known as the optical effect. Now, this optical effect or Tendal effect tells us that the colloidal particles have the ability to reflect light. A good example for this is that when you are going to open your window and allow the sunlight to pass through, and until this sunlight that passes through your window, you shake off your blanket or anything that you can shake off, and notice the effect of the tiny dust particles which you have shake off that beams with the light that passes through the window. As these tiny particles beaming with the light, you notice that the room brightens up because of the reflection of these tiny particles of the light. Another property possessed by the colloid is osmosis. When we say osmosis, the colloidal particles of the mixture passes through a semi-permeable membrane. And as they pass through the semi-permeable membrane, these tiny particles exerts osmotic pressure. Usually, the flow of these colloidal particles starts from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So that is all for the classification on matter. I will be giving you an assignment for you to work out. Just view it through the Google Classroom. That would be all for today. This is your teacher, Professor Lesitas Ruiz of Holy Name University.